can I just ask before we start, who has seen works by Lynn? So that we don't start talking about too many things and well, half the people have, half the people haven't. So we, we try to factor that somehow in as we go um, along um, with it. Um, I want to start with a very um, simple thing. There's one work in the exhibition, um, um, Video Diaries, um, where it's actually, in a way, it's very straightforward. Somebody talks to the camera, and um, um, it's almost a little bit of stream of con uh, consciousness. There's a confessional in it, but it's also a confessional about thinking about the many things in the world. Um, but it starts by saying, with the um, title when it appears, first person pu plural. And of course, in the uh, West, uh, one of our key concepts is to say I, and to understand I as singular defined a position from which we speak. So the first person plural, how did you arrive at that notion? Well, it, it was really about the individual in society and culture and really uh, how culture shapes individuals so that we're really not alone and also how technology in at the time I made those that, that video, which started around 1983 and went about 12 years, um, the, uh, technology itself is rupturing and fracturing who we are and how we perceive ourselves and how we are perceived in the world so that um, as, uh, as we're reflected back in the instigations and captures and recaptures of media, we shift and are, are simultaneously, there's more depth as to which one of ourselves we draw into a particular situation. Um, the first time, so the way we came to know each other was that I saw Roberta Brightmore, um, particular project, which we will come to, as a um, way of how to look at you could be somebody completely different from who you think you are or how the world perceives you to be. But of course, there's one very obvious thing in the exhibition that the uh, um, what you mostly see are women. Um, there, I think, are no men, from what I can. They, they occasionally appear. Um, and in the end, we come to the uh, um, genetic engineering. And that means to a degree that you focus really on those parts of the population who are maybe more self-aware, that they're constantly exposed to expectations and have to construct and reconstruct identities. I think for men, that is a much newer experience recently to become aware of it, because men are much more now exposed to um, uh, cultural mechanisms that make them very aware of the construction of their identity. But this construction of identity for women um, is a big topic. It is, and uh, in many ways it was constructed, there, there's a, a culture that constructs women for women, which is media, which tells one how they should look, uh, what makeup they should buy, uh, uh, how they can be prime consumerists. Uh, to be accepted in the world. I mean, there were, when Roberta did put ads in the newspaper and went out with, uh, in a series called Meet Mr. America, she went out with a number of men on, on uh, simple dates that were limited to three times so that she didn't form attachments with them. Um, so uh, it's the understanding, really, of the fact that, that women are, are living under a, a false presumption of who they are. And with the cyborg series, particularly with the Phantom Limbs, where you have, uh, again, a reflection of uh, capture mediums that are taking photographs of women who, in the photographs, um, understand what the capture of their image means. And of course, that was, uh, you know, those, those pieces were done uh, 30 years after the NSA started. And we were really under all kinds of uh, more extensive and repulsive surveillance um, uh, that, that then just uh, exploited itself and uh, what moved into a, a completely different uh, form of being looked at and, and really a, 
an obvious but subversive form, which now I think has shifted with genetic engineering, where instead of capturing from the outside, our essence is captured from the inside. And often there aren't any cameras to know how we're being tracked and um, what perverse uh, methods are being uh, used in order to do things like steal our memories and our future. The, 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 the camera is a, is a key um, uh, mechanism in everything. There is a power relationship as to who is in front of the camera, who is behind the camera. At some point, you make this quite explicit because you, there is uh, one work where um, you speculate about this relationship with Elvis Presley, and you actually say, nobody would believe me until they could see the snapshot. Um, it's the camera that makes it real. Yeah. And that is almost, um, we are very conditioned to trust, even though we by now know that photography is highly constructed, we are very conditioned to trust um, images generated by the camera. Definitely, um, and, and to trust it more than something we think we've seen. Uh, you know, if, there, if there's some sort of crime that you're watching and see it on the news, you believe the news, even though it, there's a different, uh, different reconstruction of what, you, what your personal experience is. And again, that brings doubt into the origins of what identity is and the confidence that one has in forming, uh, forming the basis of who they are. It's and it's also a virtual thing, you know, because it's, it's all often done through media and through lenses. And in, it was uh, 1960 that uh, two scientists named Klein and Klein um, looked through a microscope of a very bad lens and found something that they couldn't recognize and named it a cyborg. So the word itself came at that particular time through this lens. And then the lens became part of the camera and part of the viewing structure of uh, cyborgian images, which is almost everything. With, with, the, with the camera and with the photographs, there's also a direct relationship to performance. And there, um, I mean, when, when, we, when we talk about performance as an art form, it's immediately understood as something that will pass in time. And mostly that immediately implies a preoccupation with how do you fix it. And then the photograph comes in. But there's also a funny thing that performance is seen as something which is the other, as though one time we're the real, that's who we are, and then we perform. But you actually break that down in quite an interesting way, because the, the one and the performing the other doesn't work like that. Um, not in your work, and I don't think in your understanding of the world either. Um, yeah, I think that we're always shifting. Uh, you know, it, and one could say that we're always performing. It. We're all performing now. Um, and and uh, you know that the degree of which varies constantly, and I think the trick is to understand why we're doing it, what the motivation is, what we hope to uh, to achieve through through these kinds of encounters with time and with each other. When you when you understood that and understood that to become a key driver in making art, in being an artist, how did that work? I mean, how did you understand at some point that um, you, A, are an artist, or want to be an artist, or want to make art? And how did that relate to your discovery that actually your identity isn't fixed in the way that people suggest to you when you grow up? Not just you, all of us. Yeah, is in effaced? How, how did those two mechanisms, how did that relate? How did your um, understanding of wanting to make art or be an artist relate to your understanding that identity is something which is created? Um, I don't think I ever made a clear decision to be an artist. I, I think that I was always making things before I knew it was art. Um, I never had art lessons, although every, everyone else in my family did. So it was kind of growing up with the with the, the notion that this this is something I did as a survival mecha mechanism, um, spending my uh, as much time as I could in the museums and when I wasn't in the museums just to absolutely you know making things and then I, I realized that that uh, what one made and how one survived could also be manipulated and then use you know drawing on the information that I had. Uh, growing up uh, to use 
that same structure as a witness to things to bring a clear perception as to who and where we, we are and how things could change. And using art in that kind of political structure to uh, bring a different kind of um, awareness and understanding of what the conditions uh, of our society are. Um, if, we, if, we, if we follow that line of thought a bit further, to make that connection between to live, to survive, and politics, um, how does that inform your work? I think those three, those three issues are deeply embedded in everything that I do. I mean, there seems no purpose to do something um, uh, otherwise. You know, we have particular time in our lives, and time in, is fragile and valuable. And and as an artist, for me, I want to do the, something with the time I have to make a difference, and to make a difference on the political level, and to make people aware of uh, of some of the choices that they have in living, and also in some of the choices people don't have in their lives, and to have the two mesh, and and to provoke change. Um, through, through awareness, through in some sort of poetic means. When you, when you describe that, there's obviously something which is deeply personal in it. And in a lot of the work, you appear. Um, and yet the work isn't really about you. No. Um, um, again, you know, it's like Roberta is every woman. She was a mirror of culture at that time, and she reflected life that came upon her. It was almost like a, a, a presumption of almost a, 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 a visual jazz uh, uh, entity or an improvisation. Uh, things would happen that you did that she never anticipated, and it's how the, those things were were witnessed, cataloged, and dealt with that made the difference in in the interpretation of it. So uh, again, it's the extraction of the eye, uh, you know, the little eye. Uh, for the other eye, which becomes the icons for the presumption of all of our eyes. Now, now Roberta is a, is a truly extraordinary project. Thanks. Um, and one which I, even though I've known about it for quite some time now, um, I always still struggle to really get my head around. <laughs> Um, and very simply because I'm always very interested with artists how, actually, what a normal day looks like. I mean, I think it's always very interesting, anybody, with any person, whatever you do, is just to understand what is a normal day, what happens, how do you get up, what motivates you, um, you know, what are the little strategies you put into place to get something done with Roberta that is very um, hard to actually imagine how you dedicate a whole chunk of your life, your actual life. This is what I meant about the, to hand over to a project. It's a complete handover. Mm -hmm. So how did this idea germinate and then really came to fruition? Uh, the Roberta, I mean, it all happened on the cusp of disaster, as we knew. Um, the, ex the work that I was doing that had sound related to it caused the museum to close the exhibition that was only put there in the first place because they were the museum was threatened with having their funding cut because they never showed women. So um, so they closed down my exhibition and it was Berkeley in the in the sixties. And so you you think of alternatives. You know, you look at boarded up Bank of America windows and um, and look for opportunities to counter effect um, kind of the, the counter magnet to what that dynamism was. And uh, so rather than having work in a museum, it seemed to me it would be much more powerful to, to create the museum outside of a museum structure, which is why um, I and a friend of my, mine, Eleanor Coppola, set up rooms in hotel rooms. And then um, and, and that project actually lasted for a year, where there was sound. People go 24 hours a day. And, it was pre, the word site specific hadn't been made yet, and you could trespass into the saline space that was uh, made from items that were brought in from that neighborhood, so they became a portrait of a, a social economic system and structure within that particular location. And I started to think about what it would be like if 
one of those characters could be liberated and could live outside of that particular room or the rooms that they moved to in New York. There were three, three different um, rooms. And, and that was how Roberta was born. So you set, set up a, a, a skeletal um, structure for Roberta, how old she was, what her background was, um, what her fa family was, what kind of experiences she had what her education was, how much money she came, why she came to San Francisco. And once you have that, uh, you start to plant things in culture and in media. You know, what would you do? So you take an ad out for an apartment or for a roommate and you get a job. And you, I mean, she, she was not extraordinary in any way. You know, she was just trying to live during that time. And she had her own gestures, her own walk, her own language, her um, uh, her legitimacy grew through, through living through the time, getting the driver's license, getting a checking account, and uh, in a sense, again, both being the subject and the witness and the uh, external coder of what society was like. And so her, the, the dynamism of her experiences is what really orchestrated the, the other one, because nothing was, uh, was predicted. It's incredibly fascinating to hear, to hear how you describe that because, of course, the way we live, all of us, I think is by narrating ourselves to ourselves. We have to tell ourselves our own stories um, all the time. That's how we make sense of who we are. And you do that by talking about Roberta truly in the third person, although tr you know, Roberta, in a way, was you. Well, we had the same heartbeat, <laughs> but she was her own person. I mean, she wasn't. She, she was. Uh, she was a fabrication of a particular part uh, of living in that time. You you mentioned the to go back to the beginning and the um, exhibition, which is wonderful. Um, um, in a way, allows you to trace that um, development in a very concentrated form. So there are the, um, the pieces that were in that exhibition that you mentioned, so the masks, the cars that make a sound, which then were um, led to the exhibition being closed down, the museum being closed down, and you setting up the um, hotel um, project. The, the, the living and surviving, for an artist, is also living and surviving the art world and the whole system that mm -hmm. gets described so lightly as the art world. How did you experience that um, at the time? Um, well, I think it's really uh, telling that the work with sound of a woman making sound was closed down in a gallery. I mean, granted, it was the early, late 60s, early 70s, but it's that kind of silencing of women, I think, that I've been, uh, particularly of women, that has uh, really um, instigated a lot of the, the work that came after after it, and you know, there's been a, a constant in my own life um, a series of ways of my work being silenced. And so, whether it's um, going outside the gallery structure, or in one case uh, where I worked, I, I, I created three simultaneous critics, and the critics were called Prudence Sturitz, um, uh, Herbert Good, and Gay Abandon. And these critics would write articles in very well-known mag. One wrote for throwaway doorstep thing, but the other ones wrote for very well-known magazines about Lynn Hirschman, and uh, you know, creating a visibility uh, of this other person that existed. And because those those articles were published, um, I was able to get my first show. And so, finding a way beyond uh, the way we are positioned, I was positioned, is what I've had to do uh, in order to get my work seen. Um, but, you know, the first first real purchase of my work, since I was working since, uh, you know, the 50s, was in 1993. I didn't sell a single thing until then. Um, and, uh, you know, not that, not that much since then. Yeah. Um, but it's really not about me. I mean, Women Are Revolution, uh, which is a film I made, tells the story of many women who went through the same thing. So this kind of discrimination and not even retelling of a story because it's never told in the first place uh, is, um, uh, describes creative means that the feminist uh, movement itself 
had to invent in order to survive as an artist. So what one does is they look at their lives and say, uh, how can I do something that, that, that uh, doesn't compromise who I am? Somet sometimes having success too early is more of a death um, in the particular art world that exists than maybe having no uh, attention to it for many years. And I think that one has to really evaluate constantly why they're doing what they're doing and reinform their work with um, the base ethic of uh, what it is they're approaching. Can we talk a little bit more about Women Art Revolution because it's another truly extraordinary project. Thank you. Um, because it records really a whole um, a history of um, a moment of a whole lot of uh, people. Um, it has an archive behind it which is much bigger than the firm. But what I also find um, extraordinary about it, and that applies to a lot of your work, it has an underlying um, sensibility of, um, I guess, generosity and solidarity. Um, mm -hmm. So there's, there's an ethics in it as well. Mm -hmm. um, so, so if you say a little bit more about the whole project. Uh, Women Art Revolution um, was a film that evolved. Uh, you know, when I started making it, it was the 1968. I wasn't a, a filmmaker at all, but I would literally beg for cameras, and I learned how to operate one some, somewhat, um, uh, to videotape women as they came through town. And, and these were all done in my living room, my bedroom, and, uh, and uh, for no reason except I thought what they were doing was really important. You know, the 60s was a time of the free speech movement, it was a time of civil rights, it was a time of um, gaining independence. And I kept doing this uh, for actually uh, almost 42 years, ended up with about 12,000 hours of, of footage. And what I found out when I started to edit this together, because nobody had really told the story of the feminist movement in, in America, and I had I had videotapes of Judy Chicago when she was 17 and then when she was 70 and all the, all the years, many of the years in between, and not just Judy, but there were 65 women that came through. Um, so uh, it took three and a half months just to look at this footage one time, but it was, but it was a story that really had to be told and, um, uh, and I had the only footage that exists and that was even more shocking that people as well known as Marsha Tucker, who started the new museum, um, had nobody had ever interviewed her. Nobody, had, there was no record at all of most of these women, um, except for what I had shot accidentally. Uh, and um, uh, and then I started to think, well, how do you tell a story of this? There's so many stories, and there's so much in information. And what really freed me to be able to edit this footage was the idea of putting everything online. Uh, so that people could look at all of the interviews. So you could look at 17 Hours of Carol Lee Schneeman or um, many of the other, Yvonne Rayner, uh, Martha Rossler. And so Stanford University got a, a grant for called uh, Preserving Creative America and worked uh, to put everything online so that you could find the every and, and it's cross-linked, cross-referenced by, by themes so that you can not just see the film that I made but really go in and look through all of the interviews that um, were done during that time. Um, what is interesting is that when, I mean, A, I think it's very interesting that you did it as an artist. So it wasn't done by, as one might think, an archive or an institution, or you chose to do it as an artist, uh, this commitment. But it's also that then you use the web as a um, platform, as a container. And of course, one of the, I guess, um, challenges with your work, um, overused term for contemporary art always, but there you go, um, is that it always bumps and crashes into the containers. So you um, mentioned the exhibition, which then is closed down. Um, there's always a question about who will look after it, who will preserve it, it doesn't fit the categories. Um, um, and of course, there's a fundamental, um, I guess, sort of, uh, difficult, not difficult in the right work, a way of how it challenges the whole power relationship in art itself, because much art is made to be looked at. Um, so the object should be passive, mm -hmm. just the way that you know women should be looked at, exactly. and it should be passive. And you can see this beautifully in your um, 
make up instructions for Roberto, which are like a painting. That's where the paint goes, and everything should offer itself for consumption by somebody else. And you needed to get behind the camera rather than just being in front of it. So you need to become the looking eye mm -hmm. and give the voice rather than just being the um, passive. What is your relationship to the traditional containers of art, like the museum? What is it? What is it? <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, uh, well, well, I think that, that these works are taught to, taught to talk back <laughs> and, and not be passive. And, uh, and I th find it very strange now that after, uh, after 40 years or so that the works that were really against museums are now seen in museums. It's like you, you bury a, a triangle upside down and over time it writes itself. So, uh, you know, it's, it's a very kind of um, uh, strange thing. Uh, but, you know, perhaps it's time to share these ideas that can then be, um, be used in other yes. ways. Well, I find it very fascinating because I think a lot of your early work now is very reminiscent of what a lot of very young artists are doing. It just looks slightly different because the technology was slightly different, but the concept is very similar. I was wondering about cyberspace identities, mm -hmm. uh, well, fluidities. pertinent questions. Yes, all very much out there. Can we go a little bit more on the, on the surviving and the living of what this means to you now as an artist, ethically? the notion of surviving and struggle? Um, uh, I think that that, that um, survival is a struggle. And again, um, we have, we have um, uh, this rare moment, moments of our lives to understand what, it, what we could do with our time. And so surviving is to continue to uh, revive the core base of who you are and, and uh, what you're doing and to uh, remember the power that one has as an individual despite the culture and despite the repressions and despite the censorship and uh, despite all of the things that make one, um, that extract one from their, their culture and to revise and shift uh, those frames into one of, of uh, um, uh, re respect and dignity and making a difference. And we didn't want to just have the art being passive. We not, not at all <laughs> would have the audience just being passive. So if anybody has any questions, any comments that you would like to ask, second row. Um, I just go to work in New York at the Peter Bosley Stone. And I thought there were really interesting synergies with art that was present today, like Michael Kudiak, perhaps Bernadette Hawkins, who And I could see how I was curious, and I know that there's this element of um, femininity, and people like Yvonne Rainer have been mentioned, but they all have quite sort of different pathways to being a visual mediums. And I was just curious, especially the time that you've lived in the US, whereas New York is going through like the 60s, things you know, like Laura Anderson and Trisha Brown, and lots of, you know, the city has now become um, incredibly you know, hard place for artists to live. But I was curious what you thought about internet art and post-internet art and whether there were any people's work that you were interested in um, in a, from a younger gen generation, perhaps, you know, I think, again, you mentioned the new museum and initiative like Riser, which is present in that building. What, what did you come across um, in the field? Um, thank you for going to Bridget's gallery, by the way. Yeah, she certainly is. Um, again, I really struggled for a long time to get have my work shown in a gallery. And uh, this was my um, first show in about a decade uh, in New York, because nobody would show the work. Um, I mean, I, I lived with the whole history of people saying what I did was not art, because there was a presumption of what was. Um, but as far as post-internet art and uh, um, I, I think Annika Yee is an interesting artist. I think what Karen Archie does with her writing to and her exhibitions is in, interesting. And I think that there, that, that uh, I have a lot of faith in people of that age that are struggling again to use technology of their time, which they should, in order to um, to communicate. Um, so. so the element of femininity was perhaps it's become 
become, you become quite set to just work on the internet, people that deal with it. Do you feel that it's still something that feminists, artists can use as a tool? Oh yeah, in fact, they're doing it tomorrow at the ICA at 11 o'clock. <laughs> yeah, there's a gathering of, of, uh, of uh, feminist women who are going to be talking just about this. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, I mean, there's no n not doing something. There's always a way. At the very back, we should all learn that. Um, the voice that speaks to you makes a great deal about the allegedly constructive nature of identity, as if this is something new and radical. It's nothing of the kind. It's an echo of left sociologists of the 60s, like Berger and Luckman and Gottman. Sociology that was once called the sociology of soul selling. Because what the voice that speaks you never touches on is the basic categories of the market. And when it comes to it, your voice is nothing but the loyal opposition of the market. A nice little veneer of a nice, cosy, pseudo-radicalism which does nothing, challenges nothing, and <laughs> that's, I, th that's I think mas more like masking it. happened a lot earlier than the 60s. Uh, I, I think we've always created masks in order to be I'm able sorry, to... What was masking, if you're talking about masking, creating masks has been uh, the way that people were able to be free uh, in order to uh, to talk uh, to talk, and it's been going on for centuries. I think it was a statement well, more than a question. Can appears to be a question or a question statement. Is that too difficult? Yes. <laughs> yeah. Okay. <laughs> I've got a very simple question. Okay. How, how did you keep going? If you're not getting paid for it, you're not getting much recognition. Yeah. What kept you motivated? Doing the work, making change, having to exist. Um, I mean, the IR, I get, after I did the Steve Kurtz film, I started to get audited by the government almost every year. And the, uh, the IRS auditor said the same thing. Why are you doing this? <laughs> Makes absolutely no sense to do it. But what else would I do? I'd, uh, I'd, I'd have to get a job <laughs> or to, you know, it, it's, what I, it, it's who I am. So I have no choice about it. It's just what, what I do I have a choice of. I mean, there's, there are always these compuls, compulsions and, and sense of urgencies in, in what I do, and uh, you, know, you, you have to act on those or else they get louder. <laughs> and at the back there, sorry. Yes? Yes, no, I, I'm, I'm interested in the, uh, the, the section on genetic engineering. I thought so, it would be. <laughs> You see, you see that as an ultimate invasion of privacy, and I agree with you in a sense, but I belong to the generation, we wanted to find out how stuff worked. And some of the stuff we've got up in the pseudomonas and, and the gold with the silk, that seems to me that you see that as a potentially positive. Are you pessimistic about the future? Now, none of us are going to be around to see what happens to this technology, but do you think that we can use this positively? I think that we can. I mean, uh, uh, as I was saying, there there's a young man that I uh, I talked to at, at MoMA about two months ago, who had a bioprinted bladder um, created for him with his own cells, uh, where he would have died otherwise. There's no choice. And many people now are having organs that come out of uh, simple printing machines made with with uh, with cells of of their body that doesn't have rejection. The telomere, which is the uh, aging gene, um, uh, can be used to uh, uh, to understand more about cancer and more about Alzheimer's. There's a green jellyfish down there on the wall that is used to trace AIDS and to be able to treat that different. But there's the other side that once you have these progeny that are uh, cross, cross their DNA is shifted, they're progeny will all be like that. So the world will be wallpapered with new species, which will require banks to understand who we once were with uh, untampered DNA. Start, that, that we would decrease the variation. Uh, in the future, we would decrease the variation. 
It's the variation. It's the opposite. Yeah. It's the opposite. And sometimes you don't know, you know, what is going to happen for two or three or five generations. That, that uh, you know, that some toxins may come that can kill all of us. So every time you do something, it's taking a chance. And I think that as as uh, DNA manipulation becomes easier and faster and quicker and cheaper, that many people will be able to do it globally using human genes, which you can't use in the United States, but you use quite prevalently in, in the UK and other countries. So uh, the question is, you know, how are we going to become informed enough to uh, to understand that global warming does exist, that genetic uh, engineering does exist, that there are potential threats, you know, that that uh, multinational companies are owning these the patents to this material that will allow our memories to be extracted um, and new memories to be put in. I mean, people are in constant states of denial about the dangers that we're facing because of technology, and you know all also the possibilities that could exist in an enlightened in an enlightened but society. Maybe this time we will get it right. We will Let's hope so. I have a lot of faith in young people. Um, can we have one last question and then we if there's one. Nobody wants to ask the last one. Okay. Well, in that case, I would just like to thank um, Lynn for being so generous with your comments. And just go and invite you to see the exhibition. Yeah, and to thank, thank Chiara. Safe. Yeah. It's it's, great for this is Chiara, who's staying in the background, but it, it, it's her fault that this exhibition happened. And so I'm, I'm very grateful that uh, you had the uh, vision to say no to me when I said don't put those things in. <laughs> and, um, and also to be showing in this great institution.